After a couple of years of marriage, the husband came home from work and he walks in the front door and just as he gets there, his wife is standing there waiting and she reaches up and gives him a big hug. He's a little bit surprised and then she reaches up and gives him a big kiss and he says, my goodness, what is this? And she says, well, honey, I've got some big news for us. This is going to be a big, big deal and I wanted to let you know as soon as you came in from work. And he said, well, tell me what is it? And she said, I want you to know that no longer will it be just you and me comprising our family household. And he is taken aback. He said, oh, sweetheart, I can't believe it. You've made me the happiest man in the world. And she said, I'm so glad to hear you say that because mom is coming to move in <laughs> next week. Maybe not exactly what he expected, I realize that today is, in fact, a bittersweet day. And I say this every year. For some of you, it's a very difficult day. For others, it's a great day of celebration. We have people here who have lost their mothers in death, others who have lost their mother to relationship strains for various reasons, many that are even out of your control. For some, while their mothers are still on earth physically, time or disease has robbed them of their minds, and in that way, some semblance, perhaps, of relationship. Some are here today who desire to become mothers, but for a myriad of reasons, they're unable to do so. And I know that nothing that I say could even begin to ease that pain. And I certainly do not want to appear insensitive, but I would simply ask you to indulge us for a few minutes because... In this day and time, as so much that is wrong is being celebrated, we need to laud and honor something that is, after all, so very right. Abraham Lincoln said, No man is poor who has a godly mother. There have been mothers in the history of the world who have impacted their sons in absolutely tremendous ways. Abraham Lincoln was one of those. St. Augustine, the great religious leader, had a mother named Monica. And Augustine attributed the prayers of his mother as being the force that, that God used to ultimately bring him one day to the foot of the cross of the Lord Jesus. History records many godly mothers who have influenced their children for good, as you know, because I've talked about her so often, I was blessed. I mean, I was absolutely blessed with a wonderful mother. And if you get to heaven before I do, you tell her what a good son I've been. <laughs> now, she didn't need you to tell her that. She knows, but you understand what I mean. She's been in heaven now for over 10 years. I've been blessed with a tremendous mother. I've been blessed with a wonderful mother-in-law who happens to be here this morning. And I mean that. Mariana knows that I love her like a mother. And I've been blessed by marrying a woman who is not only beautiful as a wife, but a superb mother to our sons. The Bible also records the accounts of many wonderful mothers who are great examples for all the mothers who have gathered in this place today. Jochebed, Moses' mother. Sarah, the mother of Isaac. Rebecca, the mother of Esau and Jacob. And of course, Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus. And then there's the mother of James and John. You may remember the story, and I tell you, I blush every time I read this story in Scripture. And in fact, you probably should blush too. Remember the story? So she goes to Jesus and asks that Jesus let her sons sit on either side of him, one on the right and one on the left, in his kingdom. Now I know that in that moment... That's a very serious request to this mother. But I blush sometimes, and sometimes, in fact, I laugh because I'm so grateful that my mother was not alive during the time of Jesus, because just like some of you mothers, she would have potentially asked the same question of Jesus and would have embarrassed me half to death. I think about the mother of Samuel, Hannah. Hannah did not have any children for a long period of her marriage. And while that is certainly painful in our culture today, it was in large extent a very shameful thing in her culture. We don't have time to explain all of that. 
but it was a very shameful thing. It was a, a sign of God's lack of blessing, essentially. She was one of two wives, and bear in mind, the Bible simply reports this. It's not an endorsement of polygamy. And the other wife has children already. She is, as the Bible refers to her, she is considered the rival wife. So Hannah goes to God in prayer, and she asks God to give her a son. God answered her prayer, and she became the, wonder, the, the mother of a wonderful boy who became a great man of God, a man by the name of Samuel. So let's look at her story, and then we'll talk about motherhood today. What mothers do from the book of first samuel chapter one i invite you to look with me at first samuel chapter one and we shall begin reading in verse nine and let's stand together as we respect the word of god after they had eaten and drunk in shiloh hannah rose now eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the lord she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. That had to do with a particular vow of the day. It's not unspiritual for men to be clean-shaven. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman, and Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then a woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. And they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. What mothers do. Before we actually deal with a few thoughts related to that, I want to take us down one brief detour. And here it is. Mothers put up with insensitivity. Now, can I get a witness? Mothers put up with a lot of insensitivity, and there are all kinds of adjectives that we could place in front of the word insensitivity. But I want you to look back at verse 8. We did not read that a moment ago, but look at it with me. Chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, verse 8, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Now remember, she's, been, she's going to be pouring out her heart to God. She is upset. She is she is upset because she's not been able to bear children. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? In other words, Hannah, why are you worried about anything in the world? After all, sweetheart, you've got me. Mothers put up with insensitivity. Let me simply say, and guys, you'll agree with me because it's Mother's Day, and you should. On behalf of all the men who speak before they think, I apologize. <laughs> it is hard. Now, I know that there are a lot of cultural barriers, things that we don't understand from this particular text as to why Elkanah would have felt at liberty to speak that way to Hannah, and it seems very insensitive. It's hard to imagine as we read this story that her husband could in fact be this insensitive. Make no mistake, Hannah was in fact hurting, but she was also very angry. She was mad. Because, as the Bible records, her rival wife, that is, Elkanah's other wife, had been able to bear children, and she was essentially, essentially rubbing Hannah's nose in it. She was making sure that Hannah knew that she had already had children, given children to her husband. And the Bible records where Elkanah says, why is your heart sad? That is essentially a Hebrew idiom that reflects anger even more than sadness. 
So you've got a mixture here of anger and sadness that she's feeling, and who wouldn't feel that way? And Elkanah comes along, and he thinks at some level he's offering her consolation, but at the very least, in our modern Western mindset, this sounds ridiculous. Don't worry, honey, you've got me. Even though all of our friends and neighbors think that you are forsaken by God, don't worry about it, because after all, I'm right here with you. Mothers put up with insensitivity from husbands, but they also put up with insensitivity from children, too. Kids, listen to me. When you're out late and you don't let her know where you are, that is difficult on your mother. Don't be insensitive to your mom. Also, that gives your father right to stone you. <laughs> it's biblical. It's in the Bible. Lori and I were friends with a young couple many years ago, and let's just say for the sake of example, we'll call them Chip and Janine, and they were part of a church that we served many years ago. Janine and I had gone to college together, so we knew one another, and when they moved to our community, they began attending our church, and we hit it off pretty well. And I think by this time they'd had a child. I don't remember exactly, but I'll never forget, they had just purchased a new house, and we were invited to go and have dinner in their home. And so Lori and I went, and we walked in the house, and you know, you have that experience where you walk in and you know something's just not quite right. There's a little tension kind of hanging in the air, and your stomach is kind of churning because you're like, how is this going to play out? And we didn't know exactly what was going on, but it wasn't very long into the evening until we found out what was happening. It seems that they had celebrated their anniversary together. Now, remember, think back to being basically a newlywed and celebrating an anniversary together as a newlywed. They had celebrated an anniversary just that past week, and Chip, he went all out. He bought Janine... Wait for it. A brand new vacuum cleaner. <laughs> yeah. For their anniversary. And he didn't understand why she wasn't elated. And I remember him saying, Janine, honey, it's top of the line. I think that may have been the end of the line for him. Now, some of you ladies at this point in life, you might appreciate a vacuum cleaner as an anniversary gift, I don't know, but for most fairly newlyweds, listen, fellas, that's not the best bet. And all the men with their heads screwed on straight said, amen. Let's dig in. Number one, I want you to recognize mothers pray Mothers pray, verse 10 in our text, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Hannah prayed because she wanted a child. She prayed in order to receive a child. We know also, as you read ahead from chapter 2, that after she was given the privilege of having to have a child, she continues to pray. But isn't that the pattern of parenting? You pray. Many of you prayed prior to becoming parents. Once you become parents, you pray. Once your kids get a little older, you pray. And all throughout their lives, you pray, and you pray, and you pray. In fact, I'm sure that there are a lot of parents, having known the commitment to prayer that it would take to raise children in this messed up world, I'm not sure we all would have been willing to sign on to spend that much time praying. Why did she pray? because she wanted God's best for her life, which she believed included being a mother. But also, we'll find out as we read through the book of 1 Samuel, we find out she wanted God's best for the life of her son. And isn't that a picture of motherhood? There's a great lesson here for kids and for parents. For parents, this is a tough admission, and it's difficult for me to say, we pray because we don't always know what's best for our children. But as Christians, we believe God does. So we pray and ensure that their needs and their circumstances and their situations are submitted to God. We give them over to God. For kids, listen to me carefully, when your parents tell you they're praying for you, contrary to what you might think, your parents really don't have all the answers. 
They just want what is best for you, and they have, a, they have enough sense to know that ruling the universe is, after all, just a bit above their pay grade. They know that in raising you, God should be consulted. History is replete with the stories of ladies who have had tremendous impact and effect on the world, not only because of their actions, but more importantly, because of their praying. We mentioned Augustine, it's true. His mother was a key factor in terms of how he finally experienced a conversion to Christ, how he ultimately turned out. Augustine, by all accounts, was in fact a vile young man. By his own admission, if he thought about doing it, he did it. In fact, if you read much about St. Augustine, you find out that his actions as a young man would be the kinds of actions that would make the prodigal son blush. He was that kind of guy, and yet he went on to be a tremendously impactful leader in the church. And his mother prayed. It was a long time coming as she prayed, but she prayed. But by the grace of God, Augustine came to experience the grace of God. Closer to home for many of you, the reason that you are the way you are is because your mother prayed. I know that's the case with me. People have referred, in poetry anyway, to the Holy Spirit as being the hound of heaven. You know what I'm talking about? You may have read that prayer. The idea that the Holy Spirit will not leave us alone, but that he will pursue us even to the very ends of ourselves and the very ends of the earth, striving to track us down. And he is relentless in his pursuit of drawing people to the Lord Jesus. I want you to know that at times in my life, when I have been seeking to go my own way, I have been deathly afraid of the Holy Spirit. But more often, I've been deathly afraid of the prayers of my mother. So mothers pray. Secondly, mothers weep. Same text, verse 10. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Mothers pray and mothers weep. Hannah wept in distress. Again, this happened before she had her child. And I suspect there were moments along the way after he was born that it happened to her too. Mothers weep sometimes over the state of the world, I know that. But I suspect more often than not, they weep over the state of their children's souls. They weep over the actions of their children. Sometimes they weep over the pain their children have to endure. Remember when your mom used to say, honey, I'd give anything in the world if I could take that hurt away from you, and when you were a kid, you didn't understand it, but then you have kids and you begin to get it. Sometimes they weep over the pain their children inflict on other people. I saw an interview just this past week with the mother of one of the domestic terrorists in the United States that was recently killed, and she was grieving, and she was weeping, and she was apologizing for the damage that her son had caused, and she shook her head and she said, I just don't understand, and I'm so sorry. And of course, they weep joyful tears at other times. They weep at their children's birthdays, like their kids did anything. They just came into the world, but mothers weep about that. They weep about their achievements. They become weepy about that. I remember whenever I was doing music in a church where we served previously, where Chip and Janine got the vacuum cleaner exchange. <laughs> and I remember that uh, as I was doing music, we were putting together a Christmas program, and our oldest son, Zach, was born in August. Christmas is celebrated in December, so we decided we would have Zach play the part of baby Jesus. It was terrible typecasting. But whenever that lady brought out Zach playing the baby Jesus, I looked over and Lori had big crocodile tears coming down her cheeks. Every time our youngest son, Luke, would finish in a golf tournament, I would look over and the award was being given. and She'd be welling up with tears. I remember whenever Zach was in kindergarten, he graduated from kindergarten. Now, you and I both know that's an experience that changes the world, right? And when Zach was little, he had this really obnoxious nasal voice. 
And so at the end of the program, at the end of the program, the teacher said, Zach Parker has written a poem that he'd like to share with the class. And he got up and he said, roses are red, <laughs> violets are blue. And I'm thinking, this sounds familiar. I'm not sure Zach Parker actually wrote this, but anyway, go with it. Roses are red, violets are blue. This has been great, and so are you. <laughs> so help me, the woman thought she thought she had a distinguished poet on her hands. <laughs> she was weeping. And then I remember one time on the golf course, whenever Luke was partnered with a young man who decided he would rather drop the F-bomb than drop the ball in the hole. And finally, Luke had enough. And he's a big kid now, but he was big back then too. And he turned to that kid, he said, you know what, that's enough. I'm just tired of hearing your filthy mouth. That's enough. And the pride of a parent wells up within. In each case, when Luke graduated from high school, you get, some of you parents will get this. As soon as the first note of pomp and circumstance was sounded, she started crying. <laughs> we, didn't even, we didn't even see the kid, and she's crying already. In each case, you would have thought they had discovered the cure for some terrible disease, but listen to me carefully. She could not have been prouder of them even if they would have discovered the cure for some terrible disease. My mother was as proud of me when I graduated from kindergarten as when I graduated from seminary and would have been proud had I never graduated from anything at all. It's a mother's tender nature to weep both while in distress for her kids and while celebrating with them and for them. So mothers pray, mothers weep. Thirdly, mothers dedicate. Hannah made a vow. Look with me in verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Mothers dedicate. Hannah made a vow. She told God that if God would bless her with a son, that she would dedicate him to God for the entirety of his life. And God blessed Hannah with a son, and she kept her word to the Lord, and Samuel became a great man of God. In all the places that God's choice servants are mentioned, Samuel, Samuel is in the discussion. I remember reading years ago about the mayor of Atlanta. He was a follower of Jesus, and he wanted with all of his heart for his daughter to become a follower of Christ as well. His daughter was his pride and joy. Some of you dads understand this. She was a true daddy's girl in the greatest sense of the word, and she did become a believer in Christ in time. And she grew tremendously in her faith, and along with his wife, the mayor dedicated his daughter to Jesus. And as she grew up, she went off to college, and she sensed a call to go share the gospel with a dangerous part of the world. And when she came in to tell her dad where she was going and what she was going to do, he was visibly distraught. And she said something like, Daddy, my whole life you've told me you want me to love Jesus. And he said, I know, honey. I guess I just didn't want you to love him that much. No doubt it's hard for parents to give up their children, even to the greatest cause of all. But mothers often lead the way in that kind of dedication. So mothers pray, mothers weep, mothers dedicate. You and I both know I could stand here and give the list forever. Mothers love, mothers forgive, on and on. But let's finish this up. Number four, mothers complete. Look with me at chapter one, and we'll skip ahead and begin reading in verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull. They brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord for this child. I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. And as long as he lives, he is lent 
to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Mothers complete the task. They follow through. Hannah did this. She followed through with the promise that she had earlier made to God. It would likely have been very much easier for her, and I know it would have been much more comfortable at this point for her to say, but Lord, you've got lots of other good families. Lord, there are all kinds of other children. God, there's no reason for me to have to give my son to you right now, right? But what did she do? She followed through. She completed the task she had promised to do, That's a great picture of motherhood. So on this Mother's Day, we celebrate who you are. We celebrate what you've done. We celebrate the sacrifices you've made. We celebrate the love that you have shared. We celebrate the character you possess on and on and on. And we want to say thank you. Thank you for all that mothers teach the rest of the world. A son anonymously wrote the following observations about his mother. He said that his mom taught him logic. She once asked, son, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you do it too? (laughs) She taught him medicine. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they're going to freeze that way. She taught him how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. She taught him about genetics. You are just like your father, she said. His mother taught him about roots. Do you think you were born in a barn? His mother taught him about the wisdom of age. When you get to be my age, you'll understand, she said, and I'll explain it to you when you get older. His mother taught him about anticipation. Just wait until your father gets home. And the all-time favorite, his mother taught him justice, She said, one day you'll have kids, and I hope they turn out just like (laughs) you. (laughs) Well, moms, I hope that you recognize that whatever achievements, big or small, that your kids might have, you are the real fuel behind the engine of success. Whatever recognition that you're given on this day or any other could never be enough. Whatever recognition that you're given, we simply want to say to you, you earned it. A mother who had scrimped and saved to put her son through college sat at her son's graduation. And he walked across the platform to receive his diploma. He was graduating, in fact, with honors. And then, like the rest of the kids that had gone before him, he walked down the aisle. But instead of turning at the designated row where the rest of the graduates had turned, he kept walking down the aisle to the place where his mother sat, and the young man threw his arms around her neck, and he kissed her on the cheek. He placed the diploma in her hands and said, here you go, Mom, you earned this.